Hi, my name is Guy Wallace, and in this packed video short, we're going to cover the Knowledge and Skill Matrices, a chart that captures the enabling knowledge and skills, an important component of the analysis methodologies of the PAC processes for training and development, learning, and knowledge management. PACT is an acronym, performance-based, accelerated, customer and stakeholder driven, training and development of any blend. Once you've decided on which of the knowledge and skill categories that you're going to use, you capture the specific knowledge and skill items on a knowledge and skill matrices, or whatever you choose to call this. So at the top of this chart here, there's the knowledge and skill category number and name. So let's just say it's the interpersonal skills. We're going to identify some knowledge and skill items in here. And if you think interpersonally, that could include verbal communications, written communications, uh, negotiations or persuasion. You can create a whole long laundry list of these kinds of things. Um, and some of these might overlap and gap. And I found that you really don't argue with groups. You just let them spill it all out later. And you'll clean it up later in the design uh, phase. So how do we then identify all those knowledge and skill items? And for the knowledge and skill items for each one, we're going to link it and say, here's where you need it in performance. You need it for area performance A or B or C or D or all of them. And maybe you don't need it for E and F, but again, you need it for G. You need that knowledge or that skill in these areas of performance when you're performing tasks, producing those outputs to meet those measures. So this is how we link and ensure that later on when we create content around the knowledge and skill items, that it becomes authentic. It's not just active listening and the core and generic kinds of stuff about active listening. It's that plus how do you do active listening in area performance A? And how do you do it in area performance B? Might be the same. Could be a very different context. Could be dealing on the first one with your team members. And in B, you could be dealing with irate customers. And active listening is a different animal when you're in that kind of a performance context than you are when you're just meeting with your teams and having your weekly meetings or whatever area performance A might have been. For the next set of columns, selection slash train, S slash T, for each one of these knowledge and skill items, it might be that we actually select and have screening and always bring in people who understand AC, DC, electrical theory, if that was the knowledge and skill item. And what we want to really understand is that can we avoid AC, DC, electrical theory? Yes, you need to know it for the job, but we can avoid it in training because we select for that. No kidding. Each and every time. No one slips through because they have the 99 other things that we were looking for, but they don't have AC, DC, electrical theory, and we bring them into the job anyway. Because if that's the case, then there is a training implication, even though for a minority of the target audience, but there is a training implication for AC, DC, electrical theory. You cannot safely generalize that they don't need it. They need it for the job, but we don't need to worry about it because it's part of the selection. It would get an S. If it doesn't get an S, it gets a T. And what I do with most of these charts here is I say T is the default. Everything is training unless you tell me that, oh, guy, no, wait, we select each and every time for that knowledge and skill. Nobody comes into the target audience missing that. And therefore, we give it an S and we can avoid it later. And, but we've captured it as a necessary component to the knowledge and skill set that successful performance requires. We may have other uses for it later on. Uh, how critical is that knowledge and skill of active listening or ACDC electrical theory? Uh, how critical is it to my ability to become a master performer? Is that high? Is that medium? Or is that rather low? Or is it zero? It doesn't apply at all to my ability to be a master performer. Now, if you ever got a zero on that, and this is a trap that I set for my analysis teams, if they set zero, I wonder why is it on the list of knowledge and skills anyway? Does it really go there? Is it really a necessary knowledge and skill? The goal of generating knowledge and skill items is not to come up with a long list of everything under the sun, even though it's maybe not really needed. So we only want the things on the list that are truly needed to enable performance. Um, and that's what that column does. It helps us also establish how critical is it. The next column, how difficult is it to learn, high, medium, or low? How volatile is that content? If we create that content, what's its shelf life? Is it going to be long because it's low volatility? 
or is it going to be short because it's highly volatile or is it medium? And what depth of coverage, if we were to cover AC, DC, electrical theory, or active listening, is required? Can we just create content that makes people generally aware, the A, or do they be, need to be somewhat knowledgeable about this? Shallow knowledge is more of an A, deeper knowledge is more of the K. So yes, Guy needs to be uh, very knowledgeable about AC, DC, electrical theory, and he also needs to be highly knowledgeable about active listening. Well, then the S stands for skill. So should the training or content take the person to a skill level? Well, AC, DC electrical theory is something that you don't take to a skill level. You use it in a skill later on, but it would stay at a K. Active listening, we might say, well, people already come in knowing how to do active listening. We're just giving some nuances here for our context. Uh, giving them knowledge is sufficient. They'll be able to perform just giving them that. Others might argue that, oh no, we need to actually have practice, hands-on practice, if you will, with feedback, corrective feedback, reinforcing feedback, and we need to take that to a skill level in any eventual training, so that if that's the case, perhaps e-learning won't do. Perhaps an asynchronous webinar won't do. Perhaps a synchronous webinar might work, but face-to-face -face is another option or structured on-the-job coaching with a coach that's prepared and capable of delivering and providing the feedback that's necessary. Or a peer could be a coach, or a boss could be a coach. The knowledge and skill matrices capture all of this for us. When I'm collecting my knowledge and skills and systematically deriving the enablers, I typically have a room full of people and I have large flip chart paper posted on the wall one that has all the areas of performance, you can see A through G there. And then I have all the performance model charts up there with the outputs and the tasks and the roles and responsibilities and the gap analysis data. And then we would begin to systematically derive using a flip chart in the middle of the room, what are the knowledge and skills? And we'd start with that very first category of the company policies, procedures, practices, and I would say, okay, let's start to list the knowledge and skill items here for this category. Let's focus on area performance A and then list everything and exhaust that. And when we're done with that, we would say, let's look at area performance B, and does anything else come to mind, new company policies, procedures, practices, guidelines, and list those. And then list those for C, and D, and E, and all the way through G. And what we should see in our list of knowledge and skill items, and in the links to air, the areas of performance, is kind of a scatter diagram where all the X's and things are going from the top left swooping through to the bottom right. Those of you who understand scatter diagrams, that'll make a lot of sense to you. But it's one way that I can use to test and look at the final products of some other analyst to see whether or not they maintain control when they were facilitating the group. Or did they allow the group to just start randomly barking out various knowledge and skills in this category with no rhyme or reason, it wasn't done systematically, which tells me that there's a high likelihood that there'll be gaps in the data because it wasn't done systematically. And that's why we're doing it systematically is so that we avoid missing things and finding out about it later on and having to iterate back to analysis after we've done design and development and we've put it the course materials out there only to find out that it's missing things because our process wasn't tight enough. So we systematically derive these enablers. We start with one knowledge and skill category. We march through all of the areas of performance in order, in the sequence that makes the greatest sense for everybody. And when we're done with that, we go to the next knowledge and skill category, whatever is appropriate. And we start all over again with area performance A and B and C and D. Now one of the things that this also does is it forces the analysis team to confront the captured information about error performance A and B and C and D and E and F and G over and over and over again. And if we used all 17 categories of knowledge and skill, they will not have only generated the area performance data the first time when we did the performance model, they will have revisited that page on the wall and all the data captured 17 additional times. And one of the things that I've seen for decades now is that we embellish 
that area of performance data. Because as we get into these knowledge and skills, it triggers the thinking of the assembled team of people, and then they feed off one another, and they go after and improve and enhance the data captured. Missing tasks, missing outputs, missing measures are captured. Other roles that pop in are, and are involved that they didn't really think about the first time through. How does that happen, you might say? It does, is all I can answer. So what we do is we get a very rich set of area performance data using this mechanism to systematically derive the enablers. Now, can you do this in a separate meeting from the performance models? Yes, you can, but it's not ideal. In fact, it's very not ideal. It's best to do this all in one big giant meeting. I usually take three days to do this for looking at an entire job, but if you're only looking at one component of a job, you might be able to do this in less than a day or a day. But if you bring everybody together and you get this done in one effort, that's very different than doing this in two hour increments where the startup and stop and revisiting and uh, previewing and reviewing what we've done, what we're going to go do, that takes up so much time that you really don't get very far and it takes a lot longer in total touch time as well as increasing your cycle time. So if you can bite the bullet and bring everybody together here and systematically derive these enablers, you want to do that just after they've produced the performance model so that it's all very familiar to them. You know, it was done a day or two earlier at the worst case. Um, and then they can generate a better set of enabling knowledge and skills and capture all the other relevant data to help you begin to identify what's really critical here. If I can't do everything, if I can't address all of the knowledge and skills, which ones might, in a Pareto principle sense, be the 20% that gives me 80% of the solution if I cannot afford it all. I hope this video and this video series is helpful to you in your practice of performance-based training and development, learning and knowledge management. I've been practicing, publishing, and presenting on these topics since the early 1980s. My more recent book, Six Pack, covers all of this in great detail.